Today's program, an introduction to the cults. Now, here's your host, Dr. Walter Martin. Hello, and welcome to our program, The Kingdom of the Cults. This is one of a series of programs dealing with major cults, as well as the black world of the occult. We thought it would be appropriate to have one introductory program to identify and summarize the problems of religious cults throughout the world. On this program, we will not only define what a religious cult is, but we will also have examples of various cults. I sincerely hope that you will be able to view this entire series of programs on cults, which I believe you will find both interesting and informative. As we were preparing this program, our television crew had the unique opportunity of traveling across America from New York to Honolulu, Hawaii, interviewing not only Christians who are doing something about these problems, but in many cases the actual cultists themselves. On this program, we'll take you to Shaker Village near Canterbury, New Hampshire, which is an example of an early American cult. We'll explore some of the historical roots of this cult and why its beliefs emerged as they did. We'll also be going to the American headquarters of the Baha'i cult, located near Chicago. We had a unique opportunity to actually record a Baha'i worship service, and we'll be talking at length with one of the key Baha'i officials. We will be doing this in an effort to explain to you the anatomy of a major contemporary cult. Later, we'll interview Gary Scharf, who is involved in family counseling in Berkeley, California, as well as Bob and Gretchen Pazentino, who have their own ministry to cults and have written extensively on this subject. Finally, we'll be speaking with Dennis Bauer, who is the Assistant District Attorney of Los Angeles County. He'll be offering some good advice to parents that may be helpful to many of you. How can we identify a cult? All American-based non-Christian cults have a number of characteristics in common. First, their leader, in one way or another, all claim to be messengers of God, uniquely set apart to either restore or to correctly interpret the Christian message and scriptures. They all elevate their words above scripture, claiming that their words or writings are more valuable, perfect or complete than the Bible itself. For example, Charles Russell, founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower cult, maintained that ignorance of his writings could send one into eternal spiritual darkness within two years. His and subsequent Watchtower writings reinterpret the scriptures, denying many biblical doctrines such as the deity of Christ. They also say that there is no hell, and they teach that only 144,000 people will inherit heaven while all other worthy people will never see heaven, but will live eternally on paradise earth. Mary Baker Eddy, founder of the American cult called Christian Science, said that her discovery of Christian Science, prompted by her own healing, was higher, clearer, and more permanent than that given 18 centuries ago, a direct reference to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, her gospel was better than the New Testament gospel itself. Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, claimed to be called by God to restore the Christian gospel, which he declared had been lost for 18 centuries. Smith further claimed that the Book of Mormon contained the fullness of the everlasting gospel and was more complete and more perfect than the Bible. He claimed that without his approval and that of God the Father and Christ, no one could get into heaven. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were the self-appointed messiahs of the American cult called the Unity School of Christianity, one of several metaphysical cults. They claim a special understanding and interpretation of the scriptures, denying the existence of hell and teaching that all people will eventually be saved through reincarnation. Herbert W. Armstrong, founder of the Worldwide Church of God, also claimed that the true gospel was lost for 19 centuries until he restored it on earth with his cult. He claimed to be God's only apostle and that his church is the one true church. Sun Myung Moon, the founder of the unification cult, claims that Jesus Christ failed in his mission, which will be completed by a new Korean Messiah, God, the second coming of Christ on earth. All of these cults claim to be the one true church, and they all claim to be the only way to God. They are also quick to call each other cults, and yet recoil if anyone tries to label them as a cult. They can see the error in each other, and yet are blind to the error in their own doctrines and beliefs. A good definition of a cult could be put this way. A cult is a group of persons gathered around someone's interpretation of the Bible. All of them will also have one or all of the following characteristics. One, they believe they have new truth, 
In other words, the Bible alone is never enough. Two, they have new interpretation of the Bible. Three, they claim to be the only ones who have the truth. For example, Herbert W. Armstrong said, Astounding as it may seem, there is no other work on earth proclaiming to the whole world this very same gospel that Jesus taught and proclaimed. And listen again. Read this twice. Realize this, incredible though it may sound. No other work on earth is proclaiming this true gospel of Christ to the whole world, as Jesus foretold in Matthew 24, 14 and Mark 13, 10. This is the most important activity on earth today. Four, they have a non-biblical source of authority, such as the Book of Mormon, Divine Principle, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and others. Five, they have another Jesus, totally different from the Christ of the Bible. Six, they reject Orthodox Christianity and attack it through their publications and in their pulpits. Seven, they are experts at theological double talk. They generally have a pseudo-Christian vocabulary with different meanings. They are masters at not saying what they really believe. For example, Mormon missionaries claim to be Christians and read their articles of faith to potential converts. And these articles of faith sound like Orthodox Christianity. But what they don't tell you is that they are polytheists who only look like monotheists. They believe in the existence of many gods. Eight, they idolize or worship their founder as much or more than their god. Nine, they have a non-biblical teaching and definition of God and the Holy Trinity. Ten, they constantly change their theology and beliefs. For example, the Mormon church dropped polygamy the Adam God doctrine, and the denial of blacks for their priesthood. Eleven, they constantly change the date for the end of the world. For example, the Jehovah's Witnesses have told their constituents no less than six times the date for Armageddon. Twelve, they teach that salvation is accomplished by works and faith, not by grace alone. The gospel of grace is always missing or compromised. Thirteen, they are all false prophets. Joseph Smith, for example, gave 52 major false prophecies. Others include Herbert W. Armstrong and Charles Taze Russell, founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. Fourteen, there is almost always strong leadership at the top. The leaders never permit the questioning of their leadership in any way. Fifteen, there is a complete monopoly of the members' time and money, which usually includes heavy tithing, multiple weekly or even daily meetings close control of each other's activities and contacts with the outside world. Now, cults not only have a number of characteristics and beliefs in common, they also have similar tactics for gaining and keeping their members. Unfortunately, potential converts are usually caught off guard by such techniques as love bombing, popular with the Moonies, for example, and with others. Pat answers and complete monopolization of their thoughts and time. There are also three characteristics of why cults are growing in the world today, and you may wish to write them down. One, they provide answers for everything. People are drawn to other people who know what they believe, whether it is right or can be substantiated or not. Two, they meet human needs. They give and receive love. People don't join cults at first because they have examined the doctrine of these organizations. Most people spend more time checking out which car to buy than they do checking out religious beliefs, at least at the beginning. They usually join a cult because a need which is usually emotional can be met by that cult. And three, the cults always make a favorable impression. Cults always look like they know what they are doing. They also are frequently filled with clean-cut, well-dressed members. Just look at your local Mormon missionaries or Unification Church missionaries and so forth. These Bible-based cults will continue to gain members until the real Christian church learns how to meet people's needs as well as the counterfeits do. People aren't rejecting the real Jesus Christ or the real gospel. They are instead rejecting a church that they see as being harsh unloving, unforgiving, and so forth. If people are exposed to the real Jesus Christ and his love, the counterfeit Jesus will lose his appeal for them. Someone once said, and it's the sad truth, that the cults are the unpaid bills of the church. Did you know that more than 80% of those persons involved in cults in America today, and there are millions of them, were once associated in one way or another with a mainline Christian church? 
it's very important to be aware of a false prophet. This is true because otherwise Jesus would not have warned the church so many times. The sad truth is that these cults have attacked the church. We have not attacked them. And the church's responsibility is very clearly revealed in Scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we are admonished to be always ready to give everyone who asks of us an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us, to give an answer to every man for our faith in Jesus Christ. In America, cults have always been with us, almost from the beginning. Many of our forefathers came to America to escape religious persecution, such as that imposed by the concept of the divine right of kings. Cults began on American soil almost from the beginning. One such cult is the Shakers, who were a part of early Americana. A lady by the name of Anna Lee brought the Shakers' belief to the New World from England in 1770. She believed and taught her new band of followers in this place and other Shaker communities that women would be equal to men in the kingdom of God and that God is eternal unity, one in being, composed of power and wisdom, father and mother, male and female, as shown in all the works of his hand and as borne out in all the laws of the universe. She also taught that the second coming of Christ would actually be a spiritual experience brought about in the individual soul. One of her most controversial teachings was that of no relationship should be allowed to stand between the individual soul and God. That included marriage. She believed that since Jesus and his early followers were unmarried, pure and chaste, that all true followers of Christ must be that way also. Some members of our staff traveled to Canterbury, New Hampshire to visit one of the last Shaker communities left standing in the United States. Our reporter, Regina Sippel, asked Richard Kathman, who is the curator of the Shaker community there, to explain some of their basic beliefs. They have a couple of basic religious tenets. One is uh, living apart from the world. Another is to live in community. This is, well, communities like this, apart from the world, to live celibately, that is to live the Christ life and to do good works to their brothers and sisters and, and, of course, to the outside world as well. Were the good works manifested in the hard work that was evidenced here? Certainly. Uh, in terms of their crafts, I think one sees that, that dedication to, uh, to, to quality and to doing well, uh, but also in, in terms of works of charity to the outside world. An example would be there was a devastating fire to, in the city of Troy sometime in the mid-19th century. These Shakers sent um, a couple of hundred dollars, which of course would have been a large sum in those days, to aid in the relief mission for that city. What do you feel the Shakers contributed to the religious heritage of America? They were among the first to advocate equality for women and of their leadership structure women always shared equally in that here in the ministry there would have been two elderesses and two elders um, shall we say supervising community life did they have any original scriptures of their own or books that they used there is a an oral and uh, literary tradition within the Shaker Church the, that is the United Society of Believers and uh, it is their teachings and their writings explaining their experiences and belief structure. And it's, it's very powerful stuff. There's about a dozen primary works. And I enjoy reading it. And when read aloud, I think it's particularly effective. The community was formed in 1792. Can you tell us a little bit about the membership when it reached its zenith and when it started to decline? Our archives indicate to us that there were probably close to 75 members who gathered into gospel order here at Canterbury Shaker Village in 1792. Of that number, probably 55% were women and, and the balance men. That ratio has more or less pertained uh, or did until the third and fourth qu quarter of the 19th century. Probably the highest numbers of residency here within the religious community occurred between 1840 and 1870 when there would have been perhaps as many as 400 people living in the three families of the village. 
Membership declined after the third quarter of the 19th century and, and various reasons from the Industrial Revolution to commercial opportunities for men and, and women in, in factories and in commerce and in California. And, um, I, I still think the, the, the question of why membership declined has to be addressed by, uh, by uh, scholarly inquiry. That was Richard Kathman explaining some of the basic belief structures of the Shakers, a cultic organization that played an important role in early religious thought in America. Of course, as you may know, many of our major educational institutions, such as Harvard University, were originally founded as schools built on a strong fundamental religious tradition. Today, Harvard teaches the false doctrines of Unitarianism and is the key school in North America for providing ministers for this cult. The question has to be asked, what happened along the way? Now, as I mentioned earlier, I want to provide you with an actual example of a cult which is flourishing worldwide today so that you can take our definitions given earlier and compare them with the doctrines of this group. The Baha'i Faith is such a cult. Of course, this is just one of many such cultic organizations that we could discuss. Here you see the Baha'i Temple located near Chicago, which is the epicenter for Baha'ism on the North American continent. The Baha'i faith, which literally means glory of God, was started in the 19th century by a young religious Iranian named Mirza Ali Muhammad, who came to believe himself to be a divine manifestation projected into the world of time and space as a bab or gate, leading to a new era for mankind. He was murdered by Islamic fanatics in 1850 at the age of 31. He derived much of his early encouragement and support from a small Islamic sect in Iran and was a prominent teacher in Shiraz, a city in southern Iran, for six years prior to his death. There's much more to this story, but suffice it to say that Baha'ism today is a syncretistic religion which aims at the unity of all faiths into a common world brotherhood, in effect giving men the right to agree to disagree on what the Baha'i considered to be peripheral issues, but unifying all on the great central truths of the world religions, with Baha'u'llah, the successor of the Bab, as the revered leader of the Baha'is. He is known as the Messiah for our age. Baha'u'llah was once quoted as saying, quote, The religious leaders of the world have forgotten their common origin. Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad were equal prophets, mirroring God's glory, messengers bearing the imprint of the great Creator. Today, this still remains the basic core of their faith, along with the addition of the religious thoughts of other religious leaders, including Buddha, Confucius, Krishna, and others. During our visit to the Baha'i headquarters, we were able to interview one of their leaders to find out more about what they believed. We talked with Bruce Whitmore. First, we asked Bruce this question about their building. Can you tell us about the dome on your building, the writings on it? There are several quotations uh, on both the outside and the inside of the building. One of them, for example, says, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. At the very center of the dome on the inside of the building, there is an inscription which is in Arabic. Translated into English, it says, God is most glorious. It's a praising and invocation to God. Next, we ask Bruce to explain the most fundamental belief of the Baha'i faith the oneness of God, the oneness of his prophets, and the oneness of the human race. What differentiates Baha'i from other Eastern religions? The most unique aspect of the Baha'i faith is its aim to bring about the oneness of the human race. Baha'u'llah said over and over again to the Baha'is that it is abundance of deeds and not abundance of words that's going to change the world. In other words, the way we live our lives is what's important to mankind uh, achieving a higher and nobler uh, uh, existence than mankind uh, possesses at the present time. So basically, Baha'is are trying to put those principles of Baha'u'llah uh, among the principles that he brought were the elimination of prejudice, the equality of men and women, that all people must be educated, that there must be a universal auxiliary language so that all the peoples of the world can communicate together. These and other principles that Baha'u'llah gave, Baha'is are actively trying to put into practice around the world. Is there life after death? Baha'u'llah taught, as have the other 
prophets of the world's religions that we possess a soul, that this material plane of existence, this earth, is to allow us to develop that soul, have the free will to develop that soul. We develop that soul through practicing and having become a part of our lives the attributes, the characteristics of God. There are dozens and dozens of characteristics of God that we have the capacity to reflect. Love, compassion, justice, truthfulness, honor. And that what God wants us to do is number one, to be aware of those characteristics, be aware of their potential effect on us individually and humanity in general, and to practice those attributes until they become a natural part of our being. And if we're all going around, for example, trying to be kind to each other because we know that's important for our spiritual life, then imagine the potential of what it would be like to live in a world where everybody was practicing kindness to everybody else, everybody was practicing respect to everybody else, everybody was practicing love toward each other, and so on. How would you define heaven and hell? Baha'u'llah said that heaven and hell are not places, they're state of mind. That heaven is nearness to God. If you are filled with joy and happiness and contentment in your life, if you feel close to God through your efforts and the way you live your life, then that's heaven. And if your life is not filled with those things. If, if you find that your life is filled with anxiety and, and frustration and you don't feel close to God, that that's hell. And that, that's, those two states are attainable not only in the spiritual realms of God, but right here on earth. Do you believe there will ultimately be one world religion? And if so, how will this come to be? Well, Baha'is believe there's all, always been basically one world religion. There's been several interpretations of that religion. Baha'is believe that man is now destined to move toward that point where we will achieve that oneness, that unity of the human race. And that, that deals not only in religion, that deals in government, that uh, across the board economics in how man operates within the world. How will you recognize the new prophet when he appears? Baha'u'llah said that there will not be another prophet for a thousand years. Um, in terms of any prophet, the criterion you apply is their words and their deeds, what they say and how they live their life. What is their purpose? Is their purpose for their own selves or is their purpose for mankind in general? Is there a conflict between religion and science? Baha'is believe that basically there is not, depending on what the goal of religion and the goal of science is. If both the goal of religion and science is for the betterment of humanity, then indeed there is no conflict. And in fact, Baha'u'llah said that religion and science are really like the, birds of, uh, the wings of a bird, that uh, if man is steeped in dogma and tradition and ritual too much emphasis on religion that society cannot grow and move forward. At the same time, if man is steeped too much into materialism and too much emphasis on science, society cannot move forward. When there is a balance between religion and science, when the goal of both religion and science is to bring about the betterment of humanity, both materially and spiritually, then civilization can grow and flourish. Then we wanted to know what a typical Baha'i worship service was like. And he said, The worship services that are held here are not part of Baha'i community worship. This building is a gift from the Baha'is to humanity, a place where anybody may come for prayer and worship. The Sunday services that we have here, individuals, lay persons, Baha'i and non-Baha'i, read selections not only from the Baha'i scriptures, but from the Bible, from the Bhagavad Gita, from the Zen Vesta, always on a specific spiritual subject for that particular week. We have an a cappella choir that sings at the devotion and it's open to anybody who wishes to come to it. We then ask Bruce to explain how Baha'is view Christmas. Baha'is have their own holy days. Therefore, uh, a Baha'i concentrates on celebrating those uh, Christmas as a holy day of uh, Christianity within the Christian faith uh, is respected by Baha'is, but normally not observed by Baha'is. Now, if a Baha'i happens to be uh, 
the only member within a family who is a Baha'i and the rest of the family are Christians, then that Baha'i will obviously cel celebrate that holy day with the rest of their family. And the same is true for other holy days and other religions if uh, that same situation exists. As you may have already noted in this interview, the Baha'i faith generally gives greater attention to its ethical and social teachings rather than to theological speculation or metaphysics, which is wise considering the fact that spiritually they try to mix oil and water. Baha'is believe that God is a completely unknowable essence, who does, however, manifest himself in a number of different ways and has led the people on earth through all of the major prophets, including Buddha, Confucius, and of course, Jesus Christ. Finally, to put all of this in a biblical perspective, Baha'is do not believe in the Trinity, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the atonement of our Lord, a literal hell, or any of the basic beliefs of historic Christianity. They believe that Jesus only stood for morality, purity, righteousness, and so forth. And that was it. This is why we have chosen the Baha'i faith to illustrate what a cult is on this introductory program by showing you some of their basic beliefs. You can find a more in-depth analysis of Baha'ism in the study guide that goes along with this series. Now I would like to talk about the effects that cults can have on families. Gary Scharf is involved in family counseling in the Berkeley, California area and spends a good deal of his time working with families whose children have gone into cults. We asked Gary to explain some of the recruitment techniques that cults use to lure people into them. Well, I would say that um there's a number of different techniques and different groups emphasize them in different ways. Um, certainly one of the most more common ones is different forms of deception. Sometimes it can be plain outright deception in which you deny that you're from the Moonies for example or you deny that you're from a particular group uh, in order to kind of put a person's alertness on hold so that they can build a relationship and feel more comfortable and oftentimes the people resemble each other. It's a young person approaching a young person that may be on a college campus. There's a very friendly and warm environment so it doesn't seem to be uh, any sign of danger there. Uh, so deception, outright deception is one thing. A second thing is to uh, is to be deceptive in a more subtle way where you say well um, I may be uh, affiliated with something, but I'm not actually a member, and really what you need to do is find out from us more what we have to say and, and don't presume certain things about us. And using sort of misleading emphases about, you know, this is what we do in our, in our project, or indicating that you may have social projects when you don't, um, or um, interpreting certain things to be uh, social projects when they're not or Bible studies that in fact are really indoctrination sessions for uh, a, a very individualistic and, and non-biblical, in my view, uh, interpretation of the Bible. Um, so a lot of times the deception is more subtle and it's, uh, it's harder to pin down. Uh, secondly, besides deception, there's the kind of an affection that's just real contagious. It's, it's real easy to be with somebody who's real friendly and particularly when that person has disarmed you with by either lying to you or withholding information from you. Uh, it's easy to want to explore with that person. And they, the cults are very effective in using the fact that many of us, particularly in high school and college, are really encouraged to explore and to feel that however much we rush into new and exciting projects, uh, the, the task of exploring is always a good thing and it's not something to be worried about. It's something that enables you to become a larger person. Well, what we don't know a lot about is what happens when we do the exploring in a context where people can manipulate our emotions. And that's another thing that the cults are very effective at. So using affection, um, sort of baiting a person into a kind of curiosity that makes them dependent upon the group so that they're not sure that they've got enough information to satisfy their own questions, so that they have to stay longer. Uh, being reassured that the best way to stay longer is to do it in an isolated atmosphere so that they can't have a give and take and feedback with other people that can observe them changing and question them and challenge them about those changes. Um, it's a subtle psychological flow toward increasing dependency and in a sense uh, you could summarize it by saying that what cults promise is freedom. They promise liberation and what they're able to do is they can in effect uh, utilize a certain communications technology 
ways of affecting people hypnotically, emotionally, through social pressure, to create intense experiences of liberation, where you feel just really shed of your inhibitions and really connected with a group or even connected with God in a special way. Then those experiences of liberation, caused as they are by the group, create a dependency upon the group. So the experience is an experience of freedom, but the underlying predisposition is toward greater dependency. So feelings of freedom create a loss of freedom. And it's that in a nutshell, and it may be through getting you to reflect upon all the things in your life that aren't complete, or uh, brooding over uh, misplaced uh, values or mistakes that you've made, or alienation from your parents. Um, any number of ways of, of weaving into those vulnerable parts of us that are always wanting to find affirmation, find completion, find fulfillment, but don't know wh where and how to look. And t turning those experiences into opportunities for the cult to attach these sort of bursts of liberation so that you feel that you've arrived at a whole new spiritual plane when in fact you're dependent upon the group to keep generating those bursts of liberation as you get deeper and deeper into their uh, control. How can Christians reach people that are in cults? What are some of the, briefly, some of the do's and don'ts? Well, I would say certainly um, the, the first and most important thing is to really listen and to be sensitive and to love people in a way that doesn't preach at them, uh, that isn't a finger-wagging kind of love. Uh, even from the best motives, even if somebody feels that they're, they're offended that the Bible is being misused or something and they want to correct a person, usually a cultist is conditioned to perceive that as a satanic assault. So that's not going to work. Much better to l convey to the cult member that their life is important to you and that it's what are the consequences of their behavior in 5, 10, 15 years? What's happening in their relationships with their families, uh, with their friends? How is it that if there is, in fact, a spiritual blossoming that's happening through this involvement, why is it rupturing so many other parts of their lives? To be able to arrive at questioning a person that way, you have to start out by being really attentive to them and listening to what's important to them and earning the right to ask that question in a gentle and caring way. I would say that's really the core of it. Um, Unfortunately, you know, the sort of the, the normal things that Christians are accustomed to of sort of pulling out your New Testament and saying, well, now look, that's just wrong. You know, you've got to check this and check this. That kind of intellectual um, uh, sword play, so to speak, uh, is, is the first thing that cults condition people to resist. And you may even find that the cultists will bait you into that kind of thing because they can feel that they have the right answers when you disagree, because they don't have to listen to your explanations. All they have to do is observe that they're different, consider you condemned, and carry on. And so you've, you've lost that opportunity to really touch them if you do that. Um, so I would say that's the most important thing. Also to, uh, to realize so that uh, you know, God's connection to them is through their family and through the ones who are going to be there for them regardless of who they are, not because they're performing well as cultists. So to steer them toward those other resources in their life, you know, have you, how long has it been since you've talked with your mom or dad? Um, do they know where you are? Do they know that you're okay? Uh, underneath all the rhetoric and all of the ebullience of cult commitment, underneath the cultist knows that the cult is essentially holding him through his need to perform his need to fulfill these tasks. And he isn't really loved for who he is in the fundamental way. He may have some, sense, some friends in the group that care for him. But basically, most people in, in cults really long for someone who will just be there for them. So doing that a little bit yourself when you meet them is a first step. And moving toward getting them to reconnect with their family is probably the most practical thing that can be done. And avoid being baited by them, because the more you get baited, the more you, you engage them on their level, the, they, they're, you're, you're out of their league. They're going to be able to talk circles around you. Even if it doesn't make sense, it makes sense to them. And therefore, you're not going to be able to have the impact that you'd like to do to help them. What can a family do, no matter what their belief system, to reach a family member that's been sucked in by a cult? 
Well, I would say the first and most important thing is to maintain contact. Um, hold off on being accusatory or, uh, or belittling or trivializing their commitment. Take it seriously. You don't, have to, uh, you don't have to agree with it. A lot of times people feel trapped between two possibilities. One is either to be negative, uh, you know, tell their child that they hate it, uh, in which case they alienate the child, or to be positive in which they lie in which they're, they're trying to essentially buy an opportunity to, to be honest later. The problem with being positive and lying is that uh, obviously the person either sees through it and doesn't, you know, doesn't respect you for it and it becomes even more deeply alienated. Uh, the, uh, the alternative that a lot of people don't realize is that instead of being negative and instead of being positive, you can be receptive, you can be attentive, you can listen. Sometimes listening is one of the most uh, difficult but valuable acts of love that you can do for someone who's really in trouble and who's so full of an enthusiasm that they don't understand that they need very much to see how their newfound enthusiasm affects somebody that they really trust. So being attentive and listening and uh, taking seriously the fact that, that they take it seriously I think is the first thing because a lot of times parents and families go into uh, a kind of denial where they'll either say it can't be a cult because it couldn't happen to my child. What they really mean is I hope it hasn't. And so they try to avoid the possibility of considering that it has by sort of looking away from some of the facts. Uh, if the child has started to exhibit, you know, real dependency, kind of dependent kind of behavior and has really shifted a lot of their values and has become real submissive to some authority that doesn't seem to be real wholesome, then it's really appropriate for the, the parent and the family to explore that in a way that doesn't attack them and to take it seriously. Because one thing that, that we have to believe, or I believe in my, in my counseling work, is that even though the person may seem uh, hostile, uh, constantly retaliating against any kind of uh, even sensitive, non-attacking gesture from the family, even though the person seems way out in left field, there's a level at which they have a contact with their family unlike anything else in their life. And you've got to maintain that. You've got to feed that. Because otherwise they really have nothing. All they have is, the, is rhetoric and sort of artificial friendship of a cult and sort of uh, um, people wagging their finger at them at the, from the outside world. So I would say the most important thing is keep up the contact and listen and get help. I mean, more and more over the last five or ten years, I think there's more sophistication developing in areas that weren't there before. And sometimes it's a slow process. Um, you know, I might, I might say, moving into a little bit of a different subject here, but it might be interesting to your uh, viewers, uh, the whole field of deprogramming and counseling has just really changed a lot over the last 10 years. And in the beginning, it was like there was no choice other than to kidnap somebody and to sit them in a room, lock the door, and talk at them until they finally listened. Uh, a lot of that is changing now, and a lot of mental health professionals are becoming involved and finding ways to uh, bring about a real useful and sensitive interplay between family bonds to pry a person toward an openness that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and those kinds of approaches may take longer. It's not just sort of clocking the door and, and waiting a week and a half or two months, whatever, until the person leaves. Uh, it's more humane in the sense of sort of building toward a real serious conversation within a family about something that's disrupting the whole family and holding the person to account for the, what, what they're doing with their life because of its impact upon the other members of the family. When you can sort of construct a situation around that, then the, the family has a right to be there. The family can prepare to be there in the best way. They're not waiting in the next room for the deprogrammer to stop shouting. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot more, uh, uh, a lot kinder and a lot more uh, effective, I think, in helping a person on the other side of the deprogramming move into a better adjusted relationship with their past in the group and with their future. So at any rate, there's a lot of help now in those ways that weren't there five or ten years ago. And people should be aware of that and, and not feel totally isolated and totally alone. That was Gary Scharf, who is a family counselor, talking about some of the solutions a family can seek when young people get involved in cults. 
Bob and Gretchen Pazentino deal with cults every day through their organization, CARIS, Christian Apologetics Research Information Service. They have also done some extensive writings on this subject as well. We ask them to tell us what their approach is in reaching families when one of their members has joined a cult. Uh, the primary emphasis of our ministry is to families, families who have somebody in the family who has joined a cult, either one of the traditional cults like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, or one of the, what we might call the New Age or the Eastern cults like the Munis or the Hare Krishnas. And the approach we try to use with the families is to give them practical help on what they can do to relate to their, usually if it's parents, to relate to their child, and to help them see that what they're involved in is not the truth and will not ultimately satisfy them, and to show them that if they come back to their families, they can find peace with God through Jesus Christ. Bob, how do you feel about deprogramming? I feel that deprogramming is not a biblical thing to do. It's really reprogramming to your value structure. And if the deprogrammer has a different value structure than Christianity or his own, and it seems to be compatible with Christianity, it's still not something I feel the Bible teaches. And that we all we have a free will to decide what we're going to do with our lives, either accept Jesus or not accept him and so forth. And God doesn't uh, force us to choose, and I don't think that we should force others to choose. What recruitment techniques do the cults use? Well, they use many different techniques depending on which group, but I think that what we see is uh, with younger people, they usually have loved uh, dinners um, and uh, social involvement, or they take time with, um, with people on college campuses, and they show some uh, concern and, and um, enthusiasm for the person, and they keep contacting them and give them friendship and some things like that that they don't necessarily get, and they give them a different view of religion that they, that they thought they would have in their traditional settings at home or where they are, come from. Is this what they mean by love bombing and inner and outer truth? I think some, you know, I think some of those terms are they're wide, widely used, and I think, yes, um, it's giving the person something that um, they're not familiar with, and by giving them that, they don't know how to react to it, and so they, then they interpret that experience as being something that's true, and uh, it's a, a worthwhile experience to them, and they go into it, and it becomes very subjective, and then also what comes with that is the world view that the group usually offers and they don't know how to discern between what is a good world view and a bad world view or what is truth and what isn't and mostly all their life they were, they were taught that religion is very subjective and nothing is true anyway in religion it's what you feel and then these groups either have an authoritative structure or some other means to say that they have been spoken to, to by God or some other method to uh, say that they are the ones that proclaim truth for today. Gretchen, what PR techniques are the cults using today? I assume that what you mean by PR technique is, is their public relations in an attempt to become accepted by the community at large and by the religious community too as maybe just another kind of Christianity or another church down the block but a little bit strange. And many of the cults today are trying to seek that kind of acceptance. The Jehovah's Witnesses for many, many years were very proud that they were not part of evil Christendom and not part of Babylon the Great. That's what they termed all the other Christian churches. But then uh, in, in the late 60s and early 70s, they began calling themselves Jehovah's Christian Witnesses in an attempt to gain some respectability with other Christian denominations. I think it's taking advantage of um, many of the schisms we see in the body of Christ today and the many denominations and interdenominational fellowships and Bible studies and everything else we have. And, well, maybe the Way International's little twig study down the street is just another form of Christianity. So the cults, both the traditional cults and the new cults, are taking advantage of that and are using it to try to gain respectability in the community. To give you an example, the Unification Church, Sung Myung Moon's organization, has made very um, high quality videotapes of the basic unification principle teachings and they are sending those to denominational churches across the United States addressed personally to the pastors of the individual churches telling them that this is a way that they can find out what unificationism believes from an objective perspective and the whole thrust of the entire videotape series is that you think that unificationism is just another kind of Christianity, just another Protestant denomination. Gretchen, what do you tell families to do to reach their children who are already in the cults? We tell parents that number one they need to love their children and when I say children I'm really referring to grown children, children who are old enough to make decisions for themselves and who have made a bad decision in joining a cult but still they're responsible for their own actions. 
usually when parents contact us first, and, and as I said, most of our ministry is devoted to working on a personal level with cultists or with families of, of cult members, usually when they first contact us, they are desperate to do anything to get their kid out. They'll kidnap him, they'll bribe him, they'll threaten him, they'll do anything to get their kid out of a cult. But what they need to do is they need to sit down and they need to examine why the child got involved in the cult in the first place, and then what's the most positive, constructive things that they can do to reach them on a level that he needs to be reached on, a level assuming his maturity and his responsibility and his desire to serve God. Most people who join cults, most young people who join cults, do so out of a sincere love for God and a sincere desire to do God's will. They've been tricked and, de and deceived, and they've fallen into false belief joining a cult, but their motives are basically pure, and the parents need to realize that. They need to um, understand that the child is not trying to get back at them or, or hurt them or lash out at them by joining a cult. The child really thought that what he was doing was the right thing. So the first thing we tell parents to do is, if you have previously tried to kidnap your child or if you've told your child, if you don't leave the cult, I'm never going to talk to you again, or if you've done something like that, the first thing you need to do is ask your child's forgiveness. Tell them that you're sorry that you've done that that it was not the appropriate thing to do, it wasn't the right thing to do, and that you really, really, really love him, that you love him unconditionally, that whether he stays in the cult for the rest of his life or not, you still love him, and you accept him as an individual, and you respect his decision. You don't agree with it, and you don't think it's right, but you respect it and you love him. And that's the single greatest key to reaching a child who's in a cult. Bob, what can families do to practice preventive medicine against the cults? I would say that when a child is growing up in their family, and especially in a Christian home, is to make them aware of different religious beliefs and why people believe what they believe, and then show what the truthfulness of Christianity is in a very objective way so they can test the religious truth claims of what group they may be joining. It's more of an intellectual side of Christianity that I'm emphasizing rather than an emotional side. Christianity offers both, of course. But the important thing is that, that they know and understand that there's different religious options out there. And a lot of times we don't know that, the, that these things are out there. And when they see something new, they have no way to protect themselves against these things. Okay. One very important thing is I, I would term inoculation. For instance, when we used to get smallpox vac vaccines, it would give us an immunity against smallpox because it would introduce a little bit of the germ to us, and then our bodies would uh, be familiar with it. And then when the germ came along, we'd be able to have a defense against it. So one way or one thing that's important is to tell what these uh, groups believe, and inoculate so they have an idea of what the truthfulness of how these people present their views, what the strong points are of the views, and also what the weakness of the views are. So then when someone is confronted with a, um, a religious viewpoint that's different from your own, that you know how to test it, how to, how to um, um, verify its falsity or truthfulness, and this is an important aspect. That means that parents will have to get involved in thinking about their own Christianity and also what other people believe. And especially in a society we live in, there's so many religious options out there that um, when a child comes home and says, you know, I've been talking with this person at school, get involved and find out what that person is believing and then also find out how Christianity compares to it and what it, how it contrasts to it and why uh, you don't accept it. So that would mean that a, a parent has to have somewhat um, of understanding of his own faith. And that's one problem we find is that many Christians don't know what they believe and don't know how to test truth claims. And as Christians, we have an objective way of testing, you know, historically, uh, verifiable resurrection from among the dead, one thing, and that there really is a God who really cares about us. And that we don't, and whatever truthfulness these groups offer, Christianity offers it, but for real, in a real context of truth and its overall worldview, where others offer a pseudo-truth or a pseudo-love that is not comprehensive in its, in its viewpoint or its explanatory power in dealing with real problems. Gretchen, if someone I loved was in a cult, what steps would you recommend I go through to try and get them out? Well, as I mentioned before, the very most important is to ask your child's forgiveness for anything inappropriate or wrong you might have done, and then to convince him of your unconditional love. And by unconditional love, I mean a love that loves the person, even though you may disagree with what he's doing. And it has to be a genuine love, and that love has to involve commitment. It's very easy to say, I love you, and walk away. But it's harder to say, I love you, and then involve yourself with somebody else's life. One thing that we recommend for parents to do is to keep up a regular commu loving communication with their child. We talked with um, a mother whose 
son was in the Moonies and he had been, been deprogrammed twice and the second time he was deprogrammed he was home for three days and ran back to the Moonies and his mother called us up and wanted to hire us to kidnap him and, and we wouldn't do it and we told her why and then we told her um, some things that she could do and she said but I don't even know where he is they won't even tell me where he is anymore uh, I don't know if he's in the Los Angeles area I don't know if he's in New York I don't have any idea where he is so I said well you do have the address of the person who's supposed to be in charge of him and so you write to your son in care of that person and you write him every single week without fail and make the letter a long letter and make it a letter full of love and you don't have to say that you agree with his beliefs because you don't and you can even say you don't but you can tell him that you love him you can tell him that you accept him you can tell him that you respect him and that you pray for him and then share some of yourself with him if you know he likes volleyball and, and there's an interesting article in the newspaper about volleyball, cut it out and mail it to him and say, I saw this today and it reminded me of you and I wanted to share it with you. If there's a certain kind of cookie that you used to make for him when he was little, make him a box of cookies and mail them to him. And if you write him every single week and show that unconditional love and that commitment in your love, then he will respond. And after a couple of months of this, the boy did start writing his mother and they have a very good relationship now. He's still in the Moonies but the mother isn't devastated and he is beginning to think for himself and take responsibility for himself and the most important thing is that he knows that if he ever leaves the Moonies he has a place to go where nobody's going to make fun of him and nobody's going to reject him and that's very very important and then as a corollary to that we always share with parents that if they have other children or if there are other family members who are not involved in the cult they have to remember them too one of the questions we always ask parents of somebody in a cult is if the one you love is still, say, uh, a Jehovah's Witness 20 years from now, what is your life going to be like? Are you still going to be staying in bed crying till noon every day? Are you still going to be devoting all of your energies to rescuing your son or your daughter from this cult? Because if you do, what you're teaching your other family members is the way to get love and attention is to do something crazy like join a cult. And we don't want to have more than one casualty per family. <laughs> Then we wanted to know why and how young people get involved in the occult today. Many young people get involved in occultic practices, what we would call like demonism and witchcraft and Satanism, because they have a, two great desires. One is for power and one is to know the future. And most of the occultic arts promise both of those things, power and knowledge of the future. Often the young person who gets involved in the occult is one who is insecure, who has a low opinion of himself, who finds a need to assert power or authority over his peers, over the people he's going to school with or over his friends. Um, this young person uh, gets involved with somebody older, usually a dominant personality, who offers the young person power and offers him power to know the future and power to subdue his enemies or the people that he feels are putting him down or making fun of him or not accepting him. That's, those are the two basic reasons young people get involved in the occult. Bob, in your opinion, are more young people turning to Satan worship today? And if so, why and how? Well, I don't actually know the figures because it's very difficult. There are more people today than before, and statistics are very tricky. Um, I would say that people do, uh, whatever numbers would be, more or less. The thing is that as Christians, we should respond to the phenomena and respond to the people and getting involved in these things and, and show them that's not the way to, to throw their life into this kind of a thing, but give them um, the benefit of knowing who Jesus Christ really is and that true love and true power comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has to offer and get them straightened out in that, that way. So numbers in that sense, we, you know, we like to, and media likes to say, well, so many millions of people now are joining this group or that thing or that thing. But numbers are very um, deceptive in lots of ways. And I think that it doesn't matter how many numbers, it matters what people are into. And if it's your child getting involved in it, it doesn't matter if there's only one person in the group. I had a mother call me up one time and she said, um, she, she said have you um, done research on this group? And I said, well, I never heard of this group. I said, well, tell me something about it. Maybe I can give you some answers or see what they believe. And she wanted to describe this group. And I said, well, I think you could probably approach it this way. And I said, uh, by the way, how many people are involved in this group? And she goes, seven. I said, seven people? And she said, she said, you haven't, she asked me if I've written on this group. And I said, well, there's only seven people, and I, it's pretty small. She said, yeah, it's my son and my uh, ex-husband or something, you know, and two of their friends and a couple other people. And I said, well, um, no, I haven't done any research on that. <laughs> but to her, it was a very real thing. Her son was involved in it, and she needed answers. And so we feel that 
uh, it doesn't matter how many numbers, it matters if, if you're the one being, you know, that's it's touched in your life, then you have to answer it. And that's the thing that really matters. Now, of course, larger numbers, then it, tra it attracts more people responding to it, too. The smaller groups don't get as much response sometimes. So it, no matter what it is, we have to, I think, respond to it. And that's, that's um, the bottom line as Christians, be responsible. Are young people actually getting into Satan worship today? Um, I think that they get involved in it through um, friends, maybe as a as a rue, a ruse or something just to start out, and then I, then I, they find out that there is something to it, and they um, begin to, as Gretchen was saying before, experience some of these things that they they, they think as positive things, and they um, they then are sucked into it, and they have a whole um, friendships that they get involved with, and, and culture that they're involved with, and that becomes their religious bent. Finally, we talk with Dennis Bauer who is an assistant district attorney for the county of Los Angeles, a geographical area of America where many bizarre crimes are committed every year. We asked Dennis if he had any advice for parents so that their children won't wind up getting involved in cults or the occult. Well, parents can become more involved in what their adolescent children are doing, more involved perhaps uh, into a, an older age. I think most parents are involved with their children up to uh, the ages of uh, junior high school and then when the children become more independent the parents back off more. I think it's a natural process of the of the child also taking on its own identity and a transfer from uh, the authority of other people to the child's own authority. I think that's probably one of the biggest problems. That was Dennis Bauer, an assistant district attorney for Los Angeles County with some good advice for parents. Well, this hour has gone by fast, hasn't it? When all of this is said and done, there only remains one question. What are we in the Church of Jesus Christ going to do about all of this? You see, I believe that the Christian Church has a great responsibility. 150 years ago, there weren't over 1,000 cultists in America. Today, there is a number in excess of 34 million. And those are only the ones we are aware of at the moment. There could possibly be many more. Cults are growing at an alarming rate. Did you know that the combined missionary forces of the Orthodox Protestant and Catholic churches is less than 90,000 full and part-time workers? On the other hand, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, also known as Jehovah's Witnesses, has more than 460,000 full and part-time workers right now operating throughout the world. The presses of the Watchtower, for example, turn out more literature in more languages in six months than the combined presses of the entire Christian world in one year. We need to take the baptism of boldness and get out there and do something about our faith and our allegiance to Jesus Christ. Someone once said, if Jesus is worth anything, he is worth everything. Is he worth everything to you today? Are you willing to reach out to those people who are trapped in the cults with the truth? Are you willing to reach out to your neighbors, co-workers, and friends? Think about it. Learn all you can, and then speak up with the truth. May God richly bless you as you seek to do His will. Hello, An organization dedicated to the biblical principle, to each man an answer.